Alex said, happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> and I am wearing green. I mean, obviously, right? You can, it's the only green shirt that I own. Um, but as, as it is green. <laughs> but I, I didn't want to go back and forth with Alex too much while he was up here because Alex is much more quick-witted than I am. And um, he would have probably said some things to embarrass me. So I said, let me, <laughs> let me just be quiet until I get on the stage then. I can say whatever I want. <laughs> but um, I actually did a Google search this morning about St. Patrick because honestly, I'd never ever looked into him before. It's pretty cool. I mean, this guy from Great Britain, he gets sold as a slave to Ireland. And he's there as a slave for like six years. And while he's there, he gets this vision that he needs to preach to the, um, the Irish people and tell them about Jesus. Um, apparently they were worshipped, they were like pagans, druids that were there. He escapes from slavery and uh, makes it back to Great Britain and then he goes back to Ireland and he preaches and he converts all of these pagan Irish people and now he's the patron saint of Ireland. Like, that's really cool. I, I mean, I honestly thought that it was just about shamrocks and leprechauns and everything else, but there's actually some level of, of you know, spiritual significance to the holiday. So um, happy St. Patrick's Day once again. Um, turn with me to Mark chapter 14. And like uh, Alex said, we are going to be taking communion after the sermon this morning. The reason why we're doing it is because the passage that we're on here in Mark, it, it fits so well with the communion. So we just thought uh, it would be really good to do it this way. So here in Mark chapter 14, we do find Jesus um, in Jerusalem. And Jesus was just a man of action. He was a man of, of great effect. He's stirring things up in Jerusalem. He's raised Lazarus from the dead. He is stirring things up on the temple grounds. He's overturning the tables of the money changers. He's outwitting the teachers of the law, the chief priests, the elders. He's pronouncing destruction on the temple itself saying that one stone will not stand on top of another. And so as a result, they want to kill him. The religious leaders want to kill him, but they can't find anything wrong with him because Jesus does everything well. Mark, known for his um, quick and snappy writing, you've probably noticed as we've gone through the Gospel of Mark, he tends to cover large chunks of time in like a sentence or two sentences, now, at least in this end part of the Gospel of Mark, um, he kind of breaks out the 10x magnification lens and he slows down and he zooms in so that we can see the details of what's going on. I don't know if you've noticed, but since Mark chapter, um, the first 10 chapters of Mark covered three years of Jesus's life, since Mark chapter 11, we're in Mark chapter 14, but since Mark chapter 11, we've been looking at the last five days of Jesus's life. And from the passage that we'll read this morning, Mark chapter 14, verse 10, we're actually looking at the last 24 hours of Jesus's life. And so Mark has really, really slowed down. And this is significant because he, he, Mark spills a lot of ink on this particular part of Jesus's life. He wants us to see it up close. He wants to, to, to put us in the moment. He wants us to experience it. He wants us to know the details. And so he slows down. Mark chapter 14, verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So Jesus already had his Airbnb set up for the festival before he got there. Verse 16, the disciples left, went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. 
When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And so after about roughly 400 years of bondage and slavery in Egypt, God delivered his people and he saved them from the tyranny of Pharaoh. He saved them from the hard labor, bricks without straw. If you go back in Exodus and read that particular passage, God sent nine plagues to try to break down Pharaoh's will, to get him to release his people. God sent a plague of, plague of blood, a plague of frogs, gnats, livestock died, boils, hail, flies, locusts, and even darkness. Pharaoh, unfortunately, hardened his heart, and he would not let God's people go. But the 10th plague was the most devastating of them all, because in the 10th plague, every firstborn son in Egypt was going to die. In Exodus chapter 11, verse 5, it says, from the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who's at her handmill. And through Moses and Aaron, God tells Israel to take a year old male lamb and to, to slaughter these lambs at twilight. And then he says to take the, the blood of these lambs and to basically uh, put it on the doorposts and the frames of the houses. I think we are all very familiar with this story. And after you do that, to roast the lamb and to eat the lamb. Exodus 12, 12, on that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. And so we know that after, after that, God miraculously rescues his people. He parts the Red Sea. He allows them to cross uh, on dry ground. And then he swallows up Pharaoh's army between the two walls of, of sea and water and ocean that collapsed in on them. And God tells them to commemorate the day that they were spared from the plague of the firstborn, to remember, to celebrate that day because his judgment passed over them because of the blood of a lamb. And so for roughly 1,500 years from then on, and, and off and on, because Israel didn't always keep the festival, unfortunately, but for roughly 1,500 years, Israel celebrated this event called the Passover, and the associated festival of unleavened bread. And in Mark chapter 14, again, verse 12, it says, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread. That's the context that we're talking about this morning. The Jews still celebrate the Passover today. We're actually getting close to it. I think Passover is um, April 22nd at sundown this, this year. And Mark is very... <clears throat> very focused on the fact that uh, Jesus' betrayal and death happens during this Passover season. It's kind of like if I told you a story of something bad that happened and I said, and it happened a week before Christmas, you would kind of be like, oh, wow, like that's kind of even worse because it happened before Christmas and Christmas is supposed to be kind of a happy, festive kind of time. 
and now this bad thing is kind of happening. So that's kind of what Mark is doing. But the other backdrop that we find is one of betrayal. It's one of murder. It's one of death. Mark 14, 1. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. Mark 14, 10. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. And in 1 Corinthians, actually, uh, chapter 11, verse 23, apologize, sorry, sometimes I press the wrong thing. 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 11, verse 23, it says, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and gave thanks. So in Paul's mind, as he's recounting these events, Yes, it was during the Passover time, but in Paul's mind, that was when Jesus got betrayed. That was the context that Paul saw it in, at least in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this betrayal, it comes from an unlikely source. It didn't come from one of the elders, one of the chief priests, one of uh, the, the, the evil, hypocritical Pharisees. It came from one of Jesus' own disciples. It came from one of the twelve. It came from Judas. And so point number one this morning is woe to that man. Woe to that man. This is someone who had been with Jesus for three years. He had traveled with Jesus. He had watched Jesus perform miracles. I'm sure they had slept around campfires together. He had talked with Jesus. Jesus had talked with him. They had become friends. They were participating in ministry together. They were partners in the gospel together. And Judas now, like Benedict Arnold, is a name that is now forever synonymous with betrayal. And Judas, who was so indignant about how Mary used her valuables when she poured the perfume on Jesus, so indignant about that, the Bible says in John 12, that Judas himself was a thief and full of greed. John 12, 6 that he used to, says that he used to help himself to what was put into the money bag. And so he gives up Jesus for money, 30 pieces of silver. He criticized the beautiful thing that Mary did for Jesus because it was so elaborate, but he sold Jesus out for far less. And it shows how much he valued Jesus versus how much Mary valued Jesus. Money can corrupt our hearts if we let it. Again, Mark 14, 21, Jesus says, The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. You ever wonder, how did Judas get this way? How did he get this way? Obviously, Jesus knew that Judas was going to do it. Psalm 23, David says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And so David was with his enemies. But there's some foreshadowing there about Jesus being at a table with his enemies. Psalm 41, 9, even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread has turned against me. But just because it was prophesied about and written about in the past doesn't mean that Judas had no free will or that he was forced to do what he, what he was going to do. Judas allowed money to corrupt his heart slowly over time. When you're a thief, and I speak from experience, okay? I think I've told the story before where I've stolen lots of things, unfortunately, School supplies, watches, Walkmans, slingshots, BB guns, credit card fraud, breaking and entering, broken into cars, stolen car stereos. So I'm telling you, I speak from experience. When, when, you're, when you're a thief, you start small to see if you're going to get caught. It's a small thing. You test your method, how you're going to take the thing. You test the defenses. Are they going to be able, who's watching? Are there cameras? And you start and you see, if I don't get caught, then normally you'll go back and you'll steal again. You'll steal a little bit more. 
And then you'll steal a little bit more and more until eventually you do get caught and everything collapses all around you. I told the story about when I was in seventh grade. I was in Target. I was stealing watches. And I, I stole four watches that day and I got caught. The security guard didn't tell my mom. I was so grateful. But I got caught and everything collapsed around me. I didn't stop stealing, unfortunately. But besides Jesus, no one even knew what Judas was doing. And when Jesus says, one of you will betray me, no one suspected Judas. They were all like, well, surely, is, is, is it me? I mean, they thought if anyone, it might be me. But they didn't think, well, it's got to be Judas because it's so obvious. It wasn't obvious where Judas was at. It wasn't obvious at all. But Luke chapter 22 says that by the time this supper had happened, it says Satan had already entered into Judas. Like Satan himself. He didn't send one of his demons to go and possess Judas. He says, I'm going to go get this one myself. And even in that situation, as they were sitting around eating that last supper, they did not suspect that Judas was going to be the one. Woe to that man, Jesus says. How is that? Surely he wasn't that way when he first decided to follow Jesus. I couldn't imagine that he was that way when Jesus first called him. I, I couldn't imagine him already being that way when Jesus prayed all night about who he was going to choose as the 12, right? Judas was in that number. I couldn't imagine him have already being that way, but it had to be a slow corruption of this greed in Judas's heart. Take a little bit to buy something to eat. Maybe that's where it started. Take a little bit more, maybe to pay off a debt if he had debts. Uh, maybe a little bit more to store away for his own purposes. I don't know. But I think it makes a lot of sense to believe that it was something that happened slowly over time. And all the while, his heart is being hardened, and he's hardening his heart to it, knowing that he's doing wrong, but he continues to do it over and over again. He's still traveling with Jesus, never talking about it. He's still smiling. He's still laughing at everybody's jokes. He's still showing up for Jesus' sermons until he ultimately negotiates this big payoff of 30 pieces of silver. Woe to that man. I don't need to give examples to show that greed and a lust for money have taken down the most powerful of men and women throughout time in history in our country. That's obvious. But I do think we have to ask ourselves, could this be us? Could this be us? And before we quickly say no, keep in mind that right after this section, Jesus is about to tell them that they're all going to fall away. And their first reaction is, no, 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 no. Peter says, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And the Bible says they all said the same thing. And we know what happens once Jesus gets arrested. They all desert him and flee. And Peter denies Jesus three times. And so we can't dismiss it out of hand. We have to ask the question, could this be us? Could this be me? I think many of us were shocked at our annual church meeting two weeks ago when we learned that roughly 60% of us don't give anything to the church. Yet we show up, we smile, we sing songs. I think we have to ask the question, why not? Why not? It's just too plain of a fact. It's just too much in our faces. We can't just bury our heads and say, oh, it's not real. It doesn't exist. It's too obvious. I would feel bad if I didn't ask the question. Why not? This isn't a money grab we've already given this morning, right? Actually, that's why we arrange a service like that. This isn't a money grab. My goal is not to, to say, well, hey, you need to give or give more or whatever it is. I, mean, I think that's good and we should give. I'm just saying my intention here is to say, why not? Let's have a dialogue. Let's have a conversation. Let's talk about it. We tend to vote with our pocketbooks. And so I don't know what the issues are. I mean, I can, I can, 
I mean, I can make some guesses, but I don't know. I think each of us have to ask ourselves that question. You know, I appreciate our house church. I'm in uh, Zach and Elena's house church, Leslie and I are, but um, Tyler and Gracia led a discussion last week um, kind of as a follow-on to the, uh, the annual church meeting. And, and they were very open and they were like, let, let, let's have a conversation about this. Let's, let's talk about it. And, and they said, you know, not to shame anybody, you know, but I think it was to, to have conversations that will prayerfully lead us into the light if we're struggling with greed. Because I think that's where Judas went wrong. He's struggling with greed. No one knew anything about it. He didn't talk about it. But if he had brought that into the light, maybe he could have gotten some help. I don't know. I appreciate the willingness amongst the younger generation, the millennials, the Gen Zers. Uh, they, they have a desire and a willingness to be transparent about their money. It's harder for us older folk, Gen Xers, the boomers, right? It's, it's just not part of how we grew up. We were taught to kind of, your money is your money. You don't tell people about it. You're kind of secretive about it. But I think that the younger generation has a better perspective. Jesus says that it would be better for him if it had not been born. That darkness that was in Judas's life at the time. I mean, what's worse than not being born? What's worse than like never even existing? Like, I don't know, but Jesus says it, it would have been better for him not to have been born. That is what was in store for Judas. And that's where the slow corruption of greed gets us. Woe to that man. Let's talk about it, church. Point number two, Jesus fulfills the Passover. Jesus fulfills the Passover. Again, in verse 22, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Look at what Jesus does here. It's really amazing. This is the commemorative meal that they've been eating for over 1,000 years, 14, 1,500 years. They've been eating this meal and Jesus changes it. He gives it new meaning. Exodus 12, 17 says, celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. And now the familiar bread without yeast and wine are no longer reminders of the meal that Israel ate in haste right before they left Egypt. Jesus gives them new meaning. The bread, he says, this is now my body. The grape juice, the fruit of the vine, the wine, he says, this is now my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Just think of what that must have been like for them in their minds, something that they've been doing all of their lives, attaching a certain significance to the meal that they were eating and Jesus now coming and saying, no, it means something completely different. It's like showing up for Thanksgiving next year and we're eating turkey and we say, all right, now we're changing the whole story of Thanksgiving. We're not eating turkey anymore. We're going to eat whatever. Chicken. We're going to eat roast beef. I don't know. But you would think, well, well who, what gives you the right to change Thanksgiving? Like this has been around for hundreds of years now. That's what it was like. Who has the ability and the authority to change a command that God himself spoke and that had been in place for generations? The Son of God, that's who. The Messiah, that's who. The one in whom the command finds its fulfillment. Since the time of Moses, Israel had been celebrating salvation, God's mercy, and deliverance from the Egyptians. All the while, that same event forecasted and foreshadowed God's mercy and salvation through Jesus. They didn't even know. The meal foretold of deliverance from sin. And humanity isn't spared from God's wrath, from the blood of a lamb born on a farm, but from the blood of the lamb of God. That's how humanity is spared from God's wrath. Jesus is fulfilling the festival. He's fulfilling the Passover, 
And Jesus isn't just the fulfillment of the Passover. He's the fulfillment of everything of the Old Covenant, everything in the Old Testament that we read. Jesus is the fulfillment of that. He's the fulfillment of creation. Jesus is the fulfillment of what happened in the garden. Jesus is the fulfillment of the flood. He's the fulfillment of the patriarchs. He fulfills Israel's deliverance out of Egypt. All of Israel's kings, Jesus fulfills that. He's the ultimate king. All of the prophecies spoken by the major and the minor prophets, Jesus fulfills. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Psalms and the wisdom literature. All of it reflects and points to Jesus. And so think about it. I think it's fair to say that all of time, I'm going into bigger and bigger ideas here, okay? I think it's fair to say that all of time and all of history points to, revolves around, focuses on, and finds its fulfillment in Jesus. Everything. Is this how we think about life? That life only has its meaning with Jesus at the center of it. That without Jesus, life has no meaning. This is the way that we should be thinking. Colossians 1.15 says that the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. I'm preaching now. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Absolutely amazing. This is who we're remembering when we take communion together. The center of time, the center of history, the center of life, the center of existence and reality itself. I'm not gonna get into transubstantiation this morning, but the bread is his body. It is his flesh. He is the lamb that was slaughtered. The fruit of the vine, the grape juice that we take is his blood that has been painted over the door frames of our lives and that has been poured out for many. He said, do this in remembrance of me. If you are not following Jesus this morning, you are literally out of touch with reality. Listen to what I'm saying. If you're not following Jesus this morning, you're literally out of touch with reality. No cap. Just actually. Come on, teens. No cap. <laughs> actually and factually. If Jesus is everything and he's not your everything, then you are living in a virtual world. You're living in Candyland. You're living in Oz, Neverland, Jurassic Park. I don't know. But it is not reality. It is not the truth. Jesus is truth. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And he loves you. And he invites you to come to the Father through him. He invites you to paint his blood over the doorframe of your life, your mind, your heart, just like Charles is about to do here in another couple hours here. Jesus died, was buried, and he rose again on the third day. And in doing that, he showed his love. He proved that it's possible to beat death and that he's the way to do it. Jesus fulfills the Passover. He is the Passover lamb. And this is who we remember when we take communion. Let's pray.
And let's remember him at this time. Oh, Father, just to consider you, to consider and to think about Jesus and who he is for our lives, God is absolutely mind-bending and mind-blowing. To think that you have coordinated all of life, all of history, all of existence around your son so that we could come to you and to have a relationship with you, Father, is so amazing and so inspiring. And Father, we're so humbled to be able to remember our Lord and King, our Savior, our Messiah, Jesus Christ at this time and every week when we celebrate this together. Father, help us as we take the bread this morning to remember Jesus' body as it was broken for us, as he died on the cross. Help us to remember his blood that was poured out and now saves us, Father, covers us, washes us clean. And Father, let us be grateful. Let us know that we already have everything that we need, that we don't need to be greedy for more. Help us to be content. And Father, help us to see your son Jesus in what we're doing, that your son fulfills even the communion that we take this Sunday morning. Help us to love him, serve him, please him. We ask in his name.